I know it's lunch time, so I hope it's uh, it's going to be interesting for you. Today we are going to talk about uh, test driven development, and we are going to try and uh, figure out uh, if it's going to be worth it to, to be considered to for us to consider it for our projects. But before we start, I will do a quick um, introduction of myself. My name is Miroslav Christov. I've been in .NET development six, since 2016. Uh, my first two years were in a product company where we developed email marketing services. Uh, then I worked in an outsourcing company uh, where I worked on different projects in finance, marketing, retail. And now from three months uh, in Salesforce in healthcare. So uh, as a professional interest, I would say so some of them are web development in .NET, domain-driven design, test-driven development, and architecture in general. So before we can answer if it's worth to consider test-driven development, we're going to try and figure out if it's um, uh, what is test-driven development. And I've added something like a, a little bit of agenda here. We're going to go through the a little bit of history. We're going to try and define test-driven development. We're going to look at some rules that we need to follow with it if we decide to practice it. Uh, we're going to check, are there any benefits? And then we're going to have a live coding demo. So test-driven development was created by Kent Beck before 20, 25 years in the late 1990s as part of extreme programming. And it's not pretty, it's not very new. And it makes sense to be part of this extreme programming community because that's what they do. They take uh, things in software development practices that work and they put them to the extreme. Like for example, uh, somewhere I heard that um, for the code reviews, They've uh, they saw the code reviews are pretty awesome, and they've decided why don't we make this process continuous? So they they've created the pair programming technique, and it makes sense for the test driven development to come from there. They saw that unit testing are are good, people like them, and uh, and uh, they decided what will happen uh, to try and see what will happen if we write the tests first and then the implementation after. Later on, Robert C. Martin or Uncle Bob pretty nicely describes test driven development with three rules that we're going to check later. But first, I'll, I'll try to define what is TDD. And I think TDD is a discipline. And like all disciplines, there are some arbitrary elements to it. For example, here I've given an example of an airplane. Pilots of an airplane have a lot of different disciplines before they take off. And one of them is to check the outside of the plane, to, to see if everything on the outside looks okay. And of course, the discipline is a bit different for different size of planes and different components and airplanes, uh, airports, but in general, it looks something like this. The captain of the flight has to do this discipline by himself. He cannot delegate the work to someone else. The captain has to start from the left part of the nose of the plane and needs to check if everything looks okay. Then he continues to the right side and he checks again the fuselage there. He checks the front landing gear and then he continues to the wing checks the engine, checks the, the other parts of the wing. He goes to the rear landing gear. He checks if everything's okay then. Then he goes to the tail, goes to the left, and finishes on the left engine. Now, this is pretty important discipline, and uh, but, but it has some arbitra arbitrary elements to it. And... Uh, some of them, some someone might ask, why do the captain needs to go first to the right, 
not not go to the left and then to the right? Why why uh, why he checks the landing gears when he's on the right side, not on the left side? So there are some arbit probably there are good reasons for that, but uh, there might be some also arbitrary. Someone decided that that's the way we are going to agree as a community that we are going to do that. So don't don't we don't miss anything. So test driven development is agreement of set of rules that we as developers, if we want to practice it, we need to agree on and we need to follow. So to check what are these rules, the first one is, and it states that you are not allowed to write any production code, no production code at all, until you had first, first written a failing test because the production code does not exist. Now, right from the start, that sounds foolish. Why would I, I don't have any production code. Why would I add a test that will immediately fail and I don't have production code because I don't have production code? Yeah, it's, it sounds strange, but don't worry because the second rule is much worse and it is, you are not allowed to write more of a test then it's sufficient to fail. So, and not compiling is failing as well, which means that not only that we need to, uh, we don't have production code here, we need to add the test. We will add a one line to that test method and immediately it will fail because either we are going to try to instantiate something and it does not exist. And we, we cannot write any more of that test. And we need to go to the production code. And then the third rule kicks in and it states that you're not allowed to write any more of a production code. Then it's sufficient to pass the currently failing test. So now that puts you in a loop, which is like, 10, 15 seconds long. And it the loop looks like something like this. You don't have any production code. You're creating a test method. You're starting to line, a, uh, you write a line of, of, of in this test method, it immediately fails. You go to the, you go and create a class, for example. The test starts again to, to be able to compile. You go and add another, a line or two of test of, of test code it will maybe against not compile you will need to go again to the production code and write a bit of production code so if you are a programmer with any number of years of experience you would immediately say something like but that sounds stupid. That sound sounds like uh, I won't be. Uh, I'll be interrupting myself all the time. I will. Um, uh, I won't be able to finish a thought. I won't be able to finish an if statement without interrupting myself. I won't be able to finish a while loop without interrupting myself. So, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It is. It is uh, tedious. It is, um, it is uh, boring. It, it takes time. It, it, you're interrupting yourself all the time, but but there must be some benefits, and what they could be. There must be some, right? So, how much debugging? we are going to do as developers, if everything worked a minute or two ago, the whole system, everything worked a minute or two ago. For example, I've been working on projects where we had only manual tests and some functionality that was hard to test, like I need to spin off a web server, I need to make some requests, 
I need to add some data before I can run my logic. And I tended either to create a console application, which is going to invoke the logic by itself, or I was writing code one or two or three hours without testing it or with very little testing manual. And then when I start the, the project and uh, I do all the press setup and I finally invoked my logic, then I a lot of the times there were big bugs inside. So I needed to go into the debugger and at the breakpoint, step into check what is the value of this and that variable, figure out what's going on. And that takes takes time. So keep in mind that test-driven development is going to reduce your debugging time by, by a lot. You're still going to debug sometimes, but not much. You, with test-driven development, you will decouple your code in a ways that you haven't thought before, because uh, when you're writing first tests, uh, it automatically, it, it automatically forces you to write testable code. And testable code is more or less decoupled code. Might be not good code, but it's decoupled at least. So that's that's another benefit. You will only you will automatically follow uh, or at least you will be more prompt to follow. Keep it simple principle, keep it simple, stupid or the Yagni principle, which is you aren't going to need. So, I'm sorry. So the, the over-engineering is prone to be less when you're practicing test-driven development because you're focusing on behavior that you want from the system and you're trying to step-by-step -step make it. Another benefit is that uh, we as developers, uh, we Often when we integrate a package, for example, if we want, if we need to install a Nubiet package uh, that we've never worked before, what we do is go to the website of the package, uh, maybe GitHub, there's some documentation there. And we, we read a little bit of the documentation to see what's all about. But then we immediately go to the code examples and we check um, um, how we can instantiate, how we can inject it, uh, how we can use it then uh, with code examples. Because the code, uh, as uh, we've heard, uh, never lies. And it's always, uh, if, if we have those suits of, of extensive tests that we wrote, uh, that, that are written in a programming language that we understand very well, uh, we, uh, it is always in sync with the code, with the implementation. It's never out of date. And uh, it's going to be much easier for new developers to uh, to join or other colleagues that work on other parts of the complex system to, uh, when they want to use your code, they can uh, go and see all the ways that you've instantiated the code and uh, they can use it or how to use it. Also, that, that's, that one is... Um, normal because you're first writing the tests and then the code you have high, high test coverage and personally for me it is fun to write the test first at least at least it's funnier than writing the uh, the test after the fact so it's it's funny it's funnier because i've been in situations where on the daily call i was ready with um uh, ready is an interesting word, by the way. I was done by writing the production code, and uh, I, I was telling something like, "I'm ready with uh, with the code. I've tested it manually. Now I need to write the unit tests." And when I start to write the unit tests, it's boring. Like I've already tested the code manually and know it it's working. I've uh, tested it, uh, uh, and uh, now what, what should I write? I, I I write something like, "If test." Uh, if method A, uh, a shoot met, uh, if uh, a method A uh, with parameter P is invoked, should throw an, an exception. And I know it throws the exception because I just wrote it. So it's not so interesting. 
but when you when you're writing test first at least it's something like uh like a challenge you 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 have a red test that you need to make it green and when you make it green it's it's like there's always like a yes feeling to it. so even if those um those benefits are not uh, uh enough and you you might think that uh, there are weak arguments for test driven development because you can have most of them with unit testing uh, there is one benefit that i think it's the, is the most important one and it's that when you do test driven development you trust the tests you know that when you press the play button you will and you see the green mark you know that that means something you know that uh, now the change you've just made are uh, okay and you're pretty confident that the system is still working all the parts of the system uh, are still working so that confidence that give you that the tests gives you is allowing us to refactor uh, our code and continuously go and uh, and make the code the code base better so that's that's very very important and it's interesting phenomenon of a phenomenon that uh we as a human being usually we make things better with time but in somehow in software development our systems with after one two years uh they get worse and worse uh new features are harder to implement um and sometimes when we see some code that we know it's not it's not okay well the first thought is okay I, I want to fix that I want to refactor that but the, the immediately after that the thought is I'm not touching that because if I touch it I can break a lot of things and then if I break break the things I need to fix them but I have other tasks task to do so usually we, we leave the code to rot and uh if we trust the test that that enables us to extract that method then we're going to run the test and see oh, okay we've refactored a little bit here we've extracted something uh everything seems to be working okay and we can continue this process so this is the main thing that uh, that it gives you it gives you the confidence to refactor your code so um the only way we can I can show you a demonstration of test driven development is by coding live. Unfortunately for you, I will be coding live, and I, I believe most of us here are developers. So I'll I'll uh, need your help here as well. Um, what we are going to write is a stack, a data structure stack that is uh, a stack of integers and i'm not going to make that a generic stack because it we don't need that for the purpose of this demo well but uh, let's hope we can write one stack here so let's open on my test projects i will open here and I will create a new directory, which is going to be go to demo TDD. For example, let's change to that directory uh, demo TDD. It's empty, and I'm going to create uh, one project, X unit project. So we're going to use X unit for this one. Uh, X unit and the name of that project will be demo TDD um, dot data structures, for example, dot tests. Okay, we have uh, project created I will add a solution file as well 
because it's going to be easier for me then to run .NET test. Uh, .NET uh, new SLN with the name demo TDD. Okay, now I need to reference uh, .NET SLN at the project to the solution. Uh, TDD data structure tests. Okay. Now we can finally open Visual Studio Code. And let's build the project first. Let's see if everything builds. Yep. So we are going to delete this one. We don't think it. Uh, what I like to do is I like to add one package to this uh, to this test project that will help us with the testing. I like to use uh, uh, .NET add to this project uh, package, and the name of the package is Fluent Assertions. Assertions, yes. It's okay. Cool. Let's build again. Yep. And we need to add a new test file. A new class here, which is going to be stack tests. CS. And that's going to be the test. And I like to do, what I like to do is I, I like to add one test method here, um, which is called um, nothing. Just to test if everything is wired if we have X unit. And yeah, it looks like everything is wired. So we can start. And can someone suggest what the first test should be? Anyone? OK. So we can, we need to create the stack class. So what test will let us, will, will let us create the, 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 the stack? It will be something like create. We will figure a better name for it. Um, so we need to write stack. And because it, in .NET, there is another stack already, we're going to make my stack. Uh, stack equals new stack. And now we hit the first rule, which uh, uh, the second rule, which says that we should stop writing the test if uh, my stack, uh, if we have a failing test and, not, and, fa and uh, compiling is failing. So we need to generate this my stack. And where to put it, we are not going to put it in the test project, we are going to create a new project dot not new class lib with the name of demo tdd dot data structures and we're going to add this project to the solution as well so we need to do dot net uh, sln at and the name of the project which is tdd uh, data structures Okay, and now we need to add this my, we're going to delete this one, and we're going to add my stack, my stack dot CS. Okay, so let's create um, the my stack class. Okay, so. 
we need to add reference to for uh to the to the data structures from the tests. So we need to do dot net add uh to the, this project a reference to the more TDP data structures. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's check this. If we have the reference, yeah. And is it building now? Yes. Uh, so we can do dot net test and see what's going on. Still passing. And now that uh, it's passing, I can refactor. Oh, we can only, that's another rule in test driven development that we cannot ref, ref, refactor anything uh, unless we have a passing test, that the test is passing. So I want to rename this stack to, to only to stack. And uh, this one I want to rename to, to stack because I already have it reference. I can do that. And yeah, we're using the our stack. Um, but we are not asserting anything here. So what happened? Start the subject okay. Maybe the test. Uh, so um, what we can assert of an empty stack if it's empty, the new stack is empty. It's empty. New stack should return true. So we have the stack. We're going to need who is empty. We're going to invoke stack dot is empty. And immediately we need to stop because uh, this method does not exist. Let's generate this method. And what we can do to, to make it easy for us to work and we can uh, we can split the screen like this to see the tests and the implementation uh, on one screen. We can close this explorer. We don't need it anymore. Uh, so uh, yeah, we can do that. We have the ECMT method generated. It's okay for now. Uh, we can continue. I'm not allowed to write any more of production code uh, here in, uh, unless I have a failing test. Uh, and um, now we need to assert something. Is empty should be true. And now I don't have fluent assertions. Fortunately, Visual Story could here and help me. And let's run the test. See what's going on. Not that test. Of course, it failed terribly because we are throwing just an exception here. And how can we make it pass? We can just return true. That will make it pass, hopefully. Yep. Next test. Anything to refactor? No, I don't see anything to refactor. So let's go to the next thing. Uh, expect. What should we test next? What does tech needs? Maybe we should test push. So we can test. If is if we push one element, is the stack is empty? So we can say like the method is, is empty that we're going to test again. The context is stack with one element and should be should be false. 
Put in image stack, stack equals new stack. Uh, again, uh, we can make stack dot push. And as we can see, we don't have the push method. We need to stop writing the test and generate the method. Okay. What generates as push v. No, V, I don't have the element. V. And for now, let's leave it void. But we're going to change that later. Uh, so we are making notes here that we're going to change some, th some things. Um, we've pushed one element. And now we need to check uh, if the stack is empty. So again, to is empty equals to stack dot is empty. And then is empty should be false. If we run it, let's run it. Actually, it will fail because the push will throw not implemented. And some of you might think like that this is crazy. Like just write the stack already. We need to go to lunch. <laughs> yeah, it will get more frustrating. Uh, here in push, uh, we and we need uh, what what to implement. We need to set. We cannot we cannot fix this test unless we have a variable which is going to store if the stack is empty. So let's create this variable. So we need uh, private bool is empty. By default, a new stack is empty. So it's going to be true. We're going to return is empty here. And here we can say is empty equals to false because we've pushed some. That should make the test pass. And now we can refactor what we can change here. We see that here probably nothing we can do in refactor for now, unless this uh, to be made made int, but we need to write test that will force us to make this int. Uh, we can refactor this line here, new stack, just not to, to have the duplication of, in the line. We can make the set of method in the next unit. The set of method is the constructor. So we can make stack equals not this what is new stack. And we can generate and uh, yeah, read only. Read only is fine. Uh and here we can remove this line. We can say stack is empty here, and we can remove this line. We can say stack dot push one element, and then the stack dot is empty. So now we we've rid of the this duplication that creating the stack all the time. So let's run the test again to see if we break, broke anything. No, everything looks, looks good. Next text, test. So what, what can we write now? We have... Question, can I have a question? Yes. So do we have to be that granular with this? Because uh, I know this is an example, but it, if we go one by one, we, we, it, it leads to like dump implementations. Like we have this M10 written true without like an, anything else. Can we have more tests? So we define tests up front, which shapes like expectations. Then we actually generate empty methods. And, and then we can see how this object should be implemented instead of going one test and refactor it, one test refactor, because it's ex like, like making implementation endless uh, refactoring while actually we make very small steps. Can we make bigger iterations with TDD? 
by the rules uh, that we saw, no, we cannot. There are two approaches to TDD, which I'm not going to get inside uh, much details now. The one is called uh, inside out, the other one is outside in. And you can, in the outside in approach, there is possibility that you can up update the size of the step that uh, you can go with. And probably uh, you won't be, you will be co confident enough to uh, write the real, uh, probably some of the real implementation here, uh, rather than add, adding the, the data. But what this uh, iteratable and loop approach gives you, it, it uh, as I said, it gives you um, uh, ability to to reduce software en uh, over engineering. And uh, basically, that's uh, that that's the recommended way of doing test-driven development. I know it's frustrating, uh, but uh, that's what it's recommended to do. Then to write all the test suites and then uh, write some uh, implementation. Uh, writing all the test suites before uh, for this class is something like an acceptance test. It feels to me like something like this. And uh, test-driven development is more like uh, a w the way we write code. Basically, that's that's how we write code now. We, we, that's the way we write code. Uh, so uh, what should be the next one? I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, thank you. It would help sure. me with my love with TDD, but but I understand the rules. Yeah, so we can test. Uh, adding, adding one. We can test pop. We can add one. We can push one element and then pop one and then check if the stack is empty. Again, yeah, that sounds reasonable. So empty, you can check uh, one push, one pop, should return true. And we will have stack dot push something. Uh, then we have stack dot pop. We don't have the pop method. So uh, uh, we need to add it. For now, that's OK. Um, what we can do is we can check now again, boo is empty, stack is empty. And here we have. Is empty should be what should be true. We should we should be empty. We should not get anything in the in the stack. So let's run this test. It will fail. Yeah, not implemented. So how we can implement that? We can. We have one push, one pop, then we check, check if empty. We can set here is empty to is empty to true. So yeah. That's 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 okay. What we can we refactor something? We we have this data duplication here with the two zeros. That we can extract. This is what real quick. So we can make private fonts. Int x, for example, we don't care what that is, so that we can change change it easier later. Uh, we push here an x, here an x. That was a quick one. Let's run the test again. It yeah, makes sense. So, uh, we can test
public void. This is some QA stuff here now. It's empty. Uh, no, maybe pop should throw uh, the context is empty stack and the pop method when we pop something we don't have and we don't uh, we don't have anything in, in the stack and we try to pop something it should throw exception so let's check this one and in there are a few ways that we can check that this this method will throw exception and I, what i like to do in point assertion is i like to create an action which is going to be pop handler and we're going to write it that way so we can have stack.pop and this is an empty stack and then we can what we can do is we can make it pop handler should throw exactly and usually I will create a custom exception here but for the purpose of the demo I won't do that so we can throw Valid operation, probably. Yeah, and let's run the test. Yeah, we don't have exception, so we can do if um, is empty. We can involve the method when we try to pop. We are going to throw new invalid operation exception. Let's try it now. Yeah, they're passing. Next test. We can test uh, if. Uh, We can we can test pushing one element and then popping one, and we can check if uh, the correct element is is popped. Okay, um, so we need uh, pop. We're taking we're checking the pop of one pushed element. Should return correct element or expected element. Let's leave it like this for now. Um, we need stack dot push x. Uh, we need int element equals this is the packing part which is going to be equal to stack dot uh, pop and here we uh, we don't have we need to stop writing the test we need to generate the method um but the, the method signature is not correct here so we need to make it an in and we need to return something what we can return for now uh, minus one for example just to make pass uh, and we need to check here, if the element should be x, this one will fail because it will expect it, it will expect zero. The found minus one, yes. Uh, we can make that pass by storing the element in a field. Which is going to be element equals element in the private field. Okay. And here we need to return the element that we pushed. That will make this one pass. Yep. 
Next test, I'm do, is there anything we can refactor? Probably not for now. Uh, X fact, what should we test now? We need, we know that this is not the correct implementation of is empty because uh, this is just a Boolean that's not going to be the way we want to implement it. So what we can write so that we can start count, counting the, the elements that we push that will force us to, to write uh, the test that will force us to write the correct implementation. Mm, I think we can write two pushes, one pop, which will force us to count the elements, and then we can check if it's empty. So is empty. Two pushes, one pop. I should uh, be should return false. And the, we should have we should still have an element. It's and it's not going to be empty. So we can uh, make stack dot push effects stack the push why it's not no, no, it's not uh and here we need to pop we don't care what we call. And here we need to say who is empty equals to stack dot is empty. And uh, is empty. Why I'm not adding this uh, is empty logic in a method because it's very short and uh, it makes the tests a bit cleaner to, to see what we assert is empty should be false. Yes. Let's run the test. So it fails. It expected false, but found true because the pop method is setting the is empty to true. Now that will now force us to count the elements that we've pushed. So we can uh, create uh, a counter. We don't need that anymore. We need count with size equals uh, plus plus here. Just add one to the size. And by default, we will make it zero and now we don't need this one and here in is empty we're going to change check size if the size equals zero then it's empty so we thought we incremented here the size and here on the pop we are going to make size minus minus So this one passes. Can we refactor something? I don't see anything that they want to change at this moment. So what would be the next test that will lead us to the, I believe the main behavior of this tech there's, I don't see anything else that we can test except the first and last out, last out behavior, which is going to force us to implement the stack fully. 
we've checked if it throws exception. Yeah, let's let's do first in last out now. And it's going to be uh go, that's actually test for the pop with that's two pushes, two pops, and the uh, on the second pop, the element should be the first one that we've pushed. So that will be two pushes. And on the second pop, uh, we should uh, should return, pop should return the first pushed element. So that that test now we're going to force this forces to what is that uh forces to create the, the real implementation of the stack stack dot push uh we push x stack dot pop push y uh push again sorry push y and then we have one pop that we don't care about and another one which is going to be int element it's going to be stack pop and uh, here we need to check if the element should be the first one push x That's in that's it first in last out behavior. So that fails. Expected element to be zero, but found 99. And that's because the last push overrides the, the y is 99, and the last push overrides the element variable. So now we need to store the elements. Now we have to write the start. At last, and that needs to be empty. And here we need to add the element. And here, when we pop, we need to return elements. So Size minus one, yes. Okay, so let's let's check it. Yes, we've implemented the stack. So now, this example is very simple, but uh, the idea is uh, that we uh we demonstrated the three laws uh, the three rules of test driven development that we discussed and uh, uh this is ju just to 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 tell you that this is just um a very simple example and uh you need you need to practice with more com complex examples there are much much more to the test driven development than this one a lot a lot more rules we only saw uh, just a couple here. So if we go back to the presentation, uh, some things that I want to share at the end so that uh, I'm not taking a lot of more a lot more uh, time. Uh, first, the test driven development is not going to um, that's that's a common common one, but a common sense one, but it's not going to remove all the bugs. Uh, we can still miss some case. Uh, we, sh we should uh, think of our logic. We should uh, think very carefully what, carefully what, what we should test. Uh, also, it takes time to learn. So that's, uh, as I said, this example was pretty, pretty simple uh, for the purposes of the demo. But in real life, there are a lot of things that we need to learn before we can take this uh, test driven development uh, our uh, to to a real project. 
because otherwise it will going to be very hard at the beginning. There is a lot of things to consider, like where do I start? For example, if I need to create some ISPNet uh, application, for example, uh, where I uh, how how should I create my controller? Should I write the controller? How much test I should write for the controller? Should the controller check any behavior or logic, or it should it should check only um, uh, to check if we return the correct I action result, for example? Uh, there are a lot of questions like this that uh, a person needs to answer himself before uh, bringing that skill to work. Uh, so also another thing is that we still need to design skills. There is a debate about if test-driven development is a, a design tool, which by implementing the simplest one that work provides us with the, the design that ultimately we need. I am on opinion that that's not the fact and that we still need to think about our design and to know our design patterns, to know architectural patterns uh, and to um, to use those. And uh, with the design patterns, and it's interesting with test-driven development because we need to write the tests that will force us to write the design pattern. And uh, uh, usually how it goes is that we are going to probably simplify the design pattern a little bit by writing the test. Uh, uh, the other one is that it's test-driven development uh, is best. It, it gives best results if all, all the team members are doing it. You, you decide that all your going all your tests will be written in that way. Uh, that's going to be to be better to plan the efforts and to. Uh, talk about the code. And one one last thing, which is topic of its own, that the even the mock libraries say that we don't need to mock everything. And that's a topic for another another thing, but keep that in mind that when you when you mock uh, heavily in your unit test, you're you're uh, making you're coupling your implementation to the tests. And uh, in a in a very coupled way, so uh, so yeah, this this mocking everything will create the fragile test problem. But that's a whole not another topic. Why why that why is that and why we hit uh, such problems in the past on my project um, such problems on my projects and uh, it this if you have a fragile test pro uh, problem. Uh, this will prevent you to refactor as well, because you, uh, for me, it was like, if I change, if I refactor this, then I have a bunch, uh, a bunch of tests that I need to change as well. So keep that in mind if you're going to uh, to try this different development. Yeah, overall. So thank you. Oh, uh, I know we are, uh, actually we are, on time, but I don't think we have time for questions. If if anyone has question, I 